We're, we're figuring stuff out. Hey, it, it, is, uh, it was a joy this morning to see the Redemption Castle Rock team set this all up, lead worship, um, and just kind of go through the hiccups of trying to figure out how to do it. So uh, that's always good. But uh, February, the first weekend in February, where we're launching Redemption Castle Rock. That's just going to be a, a huge praise for us. It's a gospel goodbye, as Jennifer said, because we love these people. Uh, but uh, we're, we're so happy to see what God's going to do there. So if you're joining us, we're in this series called The King and the Kingdom. And it's through the Gospel of Matthew. And I hope if you have a Bible or turn on your phone, find your way some way, shape, or form to Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3. Uh, this series uh, is, is taking the, the key theme in the Gospel of Matthew, the King and the Kingdom, and, and just turning our attention to that. Because we all need to recalibrate our hearts to what ultimately matters, what, what is ultimately of... T- uh, what is of, of ultimate of importance, the king and the kingdom. In the last few weeks, we've been looking about how, how this king stepped down from glory in heaven and, and entered into our world, not like any other king, but he, he, he put on flesh. And, and so we, we celebrated Christmas. And so and now we're going to continue in the story as the king and the kingdom draws near. We'll look at that. So Matthew chapter three, I'll read the passage and then pray for our time and uh, we'll just get going from there. So Matthew chapter three, verses one through 12. I ask you to listen carefully. This is God's word. It says, in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken by the prophet Isaiah when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about the Jordan were going out to him, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance and do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the ax is laid at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. This is God's word. Thanks be to God. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you for your word this morning. Thank you for just the way that it, it brings us together, it centers us, and by your spirit, it shapes and forms us, and we're asking you to do that now. So may the meditations of our hearts, the words of my lips, be honoring and pleasing to you. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, back in the early 90s, there was a uh, skit that, that, that get, got ran on Saturday Night Live uh, several times. It came out in 1991, and it was called Daily Affirmations with Stuart Smalley. You know, Daily Affirmations, uh, 1991, it was a parody of what was at that time a beginning, growing, burgeoning, self-help kind of idea and movement. And so uh, they would start with a scene of like the oceans and you would hear Stuart's voice kind of just speaking kind of uh, in, a, in an effeminate way over the, uh, the, the screen. And, he, and he's saying things like, I deserve good things. I am entitled to my share of happiness. I refuse to beat myself up. I'm an attractive person. I am fun to be with. And then, then the scene would, would cut and, and it would show Stuart sitting in front of a mirror, looking in the mirror and the camera looking, looking into the camera and he's talking to himself and he says, I'm going to do a terrific show today. I'm going to help people. And then his, his key line, because, because I'm good enough. I'm smart enough, and doggone it, people like me. And then he would pivot to the camera, and he would just begin to talk, and he, he would say, but, but what was a parody in 1991 ha- has become the air, the cultural air that we breathe in 2020, in our institutions, in, in our parenting, in, in, in so many ways. If, the, the idea is if we could just help our kids and help one another say the right things, have the right good self-talk, then, then the, the abundant life will come out of that. 
Uh, but, but, but all evidence shows that that isn't actually the case. Unless you're Tony Robbins or Oprah Winfrey, uh, you know, you're just really not benefiting from the kind of cultural air of self-help. But it is the air that we breathe. It is the air that says, man, if we just think right thoughts and tell ourselves the right things uh, and and just kind of we're in it for ourselves. And if you write a book uh, and put a cuss word on it that you are a whatever you you, you, then you could sell a lot. And and like, yeah, I mean, they're they're bestsellers. And and in this cultural era, if there is a God or or force or goddess or whoever, then then they're 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 probably kind of like a life coach. Like a personal trainer. They're, they're there to cheer you on. Like, you can do this. You got this. And, and maybe shake their finger at you when you choose the donut over the kale. But, but that's basically God's role in this culture. Or maybe God is the director of HGTV, right? Like, your life is just basically a, a slight renovation project. You know, the bones of the house are good. But if, if, if you could just get some things tweaked, maybe a, a future version of yourself, uh, then you'll be happy with yourself. And of course, God will be happy with with you because he has to, but he, he's just trying to help you out. Just trying to make you a little bit, bit better. And, and we've found that in the church that, that that's a, that that's a way for growth, at least numerical growth. If we can be the life coach, if we can kind of just cheer one another on, then people will come and we can write the books and we'll sell the bestseller. And it all seems to be working except for God's having none of it. In fact, if you were to uh, kind of just draft up a character that, that was the antithesis of Stuart Smalley, what you would get was, is John the Baptist. Hey, Stuart with his big 1990s sweater and quaffed hair and, and, and smile. No, John is having none of that. He's not in the city. He's out in the wilderness. He, he's eating uh, grasshoppers and finding wild honey. And he's got a camel's hair clothing. I mean, the only one that I know would like that is Ryan Fee, right? Camel's hair clothing. <laughs> I mean, he's just, he's wild. His hair's wild. He, like, there's nothing about him that is attractive. And yet, uh, this is who God sends. And all the gospels agree that this is the person that's going to fulfill the prophecy that before the kingdom comes, someone's going to go prepare the way for, for the kingdom to come. And, and they say, this is John the Baptist. And, and John isn't like, he's like, you're not good enough. You're not smart enough. And doggone it, in your sin, God does not like you. And they're like, okay. And, and so when we, when we look at this passage, that we see that in the end, far better than uh, just staring in the mirror or, or trying to convince ourselves that, that we are good enough, that we're smart enough, that there is, the gospel goes far deeper and far better, something that our souls long for. Because no matter how much we tell ourselves we're good enough and we're smart enough and people like us, there are those moments where we don't really have control over our thoughts, where where you're sleeping, you're you're laying down your head at night and you feel it. Or or you're driving in traffic or you're daydreaming at work and you're like, you know what? Even by my own standards, I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough. And I don't know if people actually do like me. And, And you try to push those away, push those away. Even in uh, Daily Affirmations by Stuart Smalley, there's always, I watched several of the episodes this week, there's always a moment of crisis for him in the show. I watched the one with Michael Jordan, and he's trying to help Michael Jordan, and he's like, you know, when you push the ball into the basket, you you probably don't feel like you can do it. And he's like, no, I I feel like I can do it. He's like, "Uh, you, you probably... You know, you probably, you know, sometimes people boo you, but you got to know that you're good enough. You're, he's like, yeah, I know that. And then, and then Stuart's like, oh, I'm terrible. No one's going to watch this show. I'm probably going to get canceled. I, and he just starts going down this downward spiral and, and Michael Jordan lifts him up out of it. He's like, no, no, Stuart, you do help people. You are good enough. You are smart enough. And, and he's like, okay, well, we're going to go on to the next show. But what if for a moment, like there wasn't someone to pull him out of that? What if the, 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 the feeling of shame and guilt, what if that wasn't uh, necessarily a bad thing, but what if it was a good thing? What if we feel guilty because we are guilty? What if we feel shame because there are shameful things that we've done? What if our souls are crying out under the weight and burden of, of our sin and, and sickness and all those things, crying out for relief? What if that's God's first 
evidence of grace in your life? What, what if you, you were designed to say, man, I feel it, that it hurts when, 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 I, when I haven't measured up, when I'm not good enough, when, when I have sinned, when I have broken God's love. What, what if that is actually the beginning to a life that really is full of joy and hope? And, and that's what it is. That, that's why God sends John the Baptist. See, see, if you're the king and you're coming to establish your kingdom and you're all powerful, but the problem is when you come to establish your kingdom, there, there's not like any pockets of resistance. There, there's not a, a, a group waiting for your kingdom to come and just ex- like, like everyone has turned their back on you and everyone says, I will go my own way. So what do you do? Well, if you're an all-powerful king and you come and everyone's a rebel, everyone's a sinner, then you have two options. You can either take them all out and start over, or if you really are powerful and you have what C.S. Lewis would refer to as deep magic, then by that deep magic, love and grace, you turn enemies and rebels into citizens and sons and daughters. And so far from uh, our our need of just telling ourselves we're good enough, uh, we we need something deeper. The king needs to prepare us to change us. And so uh, what John says, the first step in that is what the Bible calls repentance. In in, in verse 2, he says, uh, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He says, repent, turn away from your sin, turn away from your kingdom living, and, and live towards his kingdom. Now, the Bible is, is explicit on this. It is, it is the gateway. It is the front door to the kingdom, turning from our sin and turning to God. So, because this is a central theme of not only Matthew's gospel and the king and the kingdom, uh, but of the Bible, I want to do something that I don't normally do. I'm going to put six things up here of, uh, on the screen of what are what are what is biblical repentance? Why is it so important? Biblical repentance. Number one, we see that biblical repentance is uh, turning toward the king and the kingdom with our whole being. So, so when John says, uh, repent, uh, the king is coming. He's, he's calling us to turn away from the king, uh, uh, turn away from our own lives and toward the king and the king. The problem is all of us, are trying to build our own kingdoms. We want to be on the throne of our own kingdom. We, we want to be served. I, I want to be served. I want to be acknowledged as, as good enough and smart enough. I, I want my kids and my, my wife to dote on me and to serve me. I don't want to wait for anything. I, I don't want to uh, exercise patience. I want to be the king and so, or queen for you, whatever the case may be. So do you. So don't judge me. That's who you are. And so the first thing is saying, man, I got to step down off of my tiny little throne and, and, and step towards the kingdom. But, but there's a problem there. Because if you're, if you're a believer, we're going to find out that part of it is you, you've got the spirit in, in you that wants the king and the kingdom. But you also have this thing in you that still wants to have your own little throne. And, and I do my best every day of living to hold on to both. Jesus, I want to honor you as king. I, w- I, want you to, I want you to just rule and reign over my life. But I also, I want this too. I, I, I just want to be king also. And again, God's not having it. And, and so he says, first of all, turn, repent, uh, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The, the second thing is biblical repentance acknowledges sin and produces godly grief over our rebellion against the king. The thing about repentance is no one likes to do it. There's no one in this room that's like, man, you know what? I love to repent. Like it's painful. It it stings. It it stings when we repent before God. It stings when we repent before uh, each other. Like, because it's it's just an admission, man. I'm not what I want to be. It's not what, uh, not what I, who, who I should be. And so, and so it, it stings, but it's an acknowledgement of sin and, and it produces godly grief. So the apostle Paul will talk about this in Corinthians chapter, second Corinthians chapter seven. He'll say there's two kinds of grief, like, like there's worldly grief and there's godly grief. Worldly grief is uh, you are exposed for your sin and you feel bad because you got exposed. It doesn't actually change anything. It was like, oh, that, that sucks that they found out about that. 
But, 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 but he says that leads to death, but, but there is a godly grief that leads to life. When you recognize that you have sinned before the king of kings, that he is holy and he is worthy of all our devotion, worship, and love, and obedience, and we have sinned against that, that should cause a grief in us. It, 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 in the Bible, there, was, there are often this outward expressions. The Bible says they were weeping and gnashing their teeth. I mean, it's just that, that picture. Who, who weeps and gnashes? They, they fall on their faces. They, they take off, they, they tear their clothes. They put on sackcloth and cover their heads with ashes. Just this really tangible, visual kind of repentance and, and, and mourning over sin. You have not understood the kingdom of God if you have never mourned over your sin. Because it is the front door to the kingdom. There has to be a recognition of sin before the king and the kingdom. And there has to be a, a, a grief that comes with that. But, but out of that is eventually going to be born joy. But let's not get there too quickly. Verse th- uh, number three, biblical repentance names sin specifically and turns from specific sin. So in verse six, we say, we see that they had come out and they were confessing their sins. So it's not enough even in our time of confession to be like, yeah, Lord, in general, I I have rebelled. No. Biblical repentance seeks to name and identify every sin and confess it. This is deep in the, 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 the history of God's people. So in Leviticus chapter 16. When Paul, when, when God instructs Aaron, uh, the high priest of the day of atonement, it's called Yom Kippur. It's the most holy day for the Jewish people. It is the day where the, the sins of the people are going to be atoned for. And then there's a series of sacrifices that have to be made to prepare the high priest to make atonement for all the people of Israel. And so I, he, he just literally just gets covered in the blood of the sacrifice. But then there's two goats that are brought up. And, and one goat is sacrificed for the sins of all the people for the last year. But then the other goat... God tells Aaron, put your hands on the goat's head and begin to confess the sins of the people. So picture this. For the whole year, this day, all the sacrifices have been made. But now with the hands on the goat, the high priest is is to call out and say, Lord, we've been an idolatrous people. And here's how our idolatry has been looking. Lord, we have been an adulterous people. We have sought to uh, fill our sexual desires outside of your will and reign. Lord, we've been a greedy people. And he would go on and on and on. And all day he would confess the sins of the people. And symbolically, the sins of the people were taken from them and transferred to this goat. And then someone would take the goat way out into the wilderness and leave it. It was this picture of God taking sin out of the camp and, and putting it out into the wilderness. But it was specific. It it was very tangible. It was like, this is the way. In in Luke chapter 3, where he talks about John the Baptist, the crowd calls out to John and says, what should we do? And John gets very specific. He's like, look, if if you're greedy, if you're wealthy, you need to give your your extra cloak to someone else. If you're you're in the army, don't, don't extort the people. If you're a tax collector, don't take more than you need. He gets very, very specific. We have to get very specific if we're going to repent biblically. But then the next one says biblical repentance is what we see is done in community. Verse five, then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about the Jordan were going out to him. They were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. This was a community project. Again, we don't like that. We don't want to admit to each other. But, but if you really want to have a change, you really want to uh, turn toward the kingdom, then, then it's done in community. It's done together. This is just the, the, the pattern in the Bible. And, and so, uh, for example, a besetting sin uh, of our culture and one that no one ever admits that they have is greed. I've never met a greedy person. I, I've never met someone that says, my basic problem is I'm greedy. But here's a test for you. Would you be willing to open up to some of your brothers and sisters your bank account? Would you show someone what you make, what you spend, and what you give? I do. 
The other elders in this, this church have access to what I make, what I spend, and what I give. Because it guards my heart. I'm not saying I'm not greedy, but I, I confess it in community. Or what if your issue is lust? What if you have a pornography par- problem? You know, there, there are wise steps that you should take. That there is accountability software. I've, I've done that with lots of guys. I've sent my reports. To, but, but the best example I know of is a friend of mine who he's like, yeah, I, don't, I just don't want to wrestle with this anymore. So signed up for Covenant Eyes, put me on it, but he put someone else on it. His mother-in-law. <laughs> he says, you know, that's just not a conversation I ever want to have. <laughs> it's no temptation for me anymore. It's wise. It's wise. He invites the community. Like so if you're an angry person, like you, you repent to, to your wife, to your kids, but you also get some help. Maybe you get some counseling. Like, like it's done in community, biblical repentance. No, number, uh, I don't even know what number I'm done. Oh, five, biblical repentance always precedes a movement of God in our lives individually and together. Notice, again, this is the most anti-church growth strategy ever, what John is doing. And yet God is on the move. He is bringing, uh, verse 5, then Jerusalem, all of Judea, all the region about the Jordan were going out to him. And they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Every movement of God on our lives individually and corporately as a nation starts with repentance. It is the front door to the kingdom. And and so uh, we should not expect, you should not expect God to move powerfully in your life if you have unconfessed, unrepented sin in your life. You're presuming upon God. The last one, number six, biblical repentance is necessary for everybody. Notice the Pharisees and the Sadducees had come out, the the religious leaders, and they're they're probably thinking it's about time some of these people repent because they need to. And John turns to them and says, no, you need to. You need to repent of your self-righteousness. You need to repent of uh, of all the ways that you have fallen short. And and he goes after the people that have trusted in themselves, trusted in their self-righteousness, trusted in their heritage, trusted in their religion. It's the people that are like, of course I'm a Christian. My my daddy was a Christian. My granddaddy was a Christian. Everyone's a Christian. I'm just in automatically by default. No, everyone must repent to enter into this kingdom. So there's a snapshot of biblical repentance. The other thing that we see in this passage is just what we come to uh, uh, and understand, which is baptism. Baptism. We see it several times. There's a few things you need to know about baptism. The word is baptizo. uh, So we don't have a good translation. We just kind of took it and made it an English word. But but in the first century, they did baptisms. But as today, then, it was an outward symbol of an inward reality. But, But it was reserved for Gentile converts to Judaism. So, so if a Gentile was like, hey, I believe in the living God of, of the universe, that he's your God, and I want to join your community, they're like, okay, go out to the Jordan, and as a symbol of you crossing out of the wilderness and into the community of faith, like we crossed over the Red Sea, you're going to get baptized there, and as a symbol of your need for washing and renewal, you're going to get baptized there. But the shocking thing is, it's Jews that are coming out. All of Judea and Jerusalem, they're coming out and they're getting baptized. And, and, and John's very specific. He says, this is a baptism of repentance. He says, I baptize you with water for repentance, but, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. This is a foreshadow. This is to point to the ultimate baptism of the Holy Spirit. John gets a a bad rap for being a hellfire and brimstone preacher, but he's also the first one that preaches the gospel, that that good news is coming. The Holy Spirit is going to baptize you. And so they're getting baptized. It says his winnowing fork is in his hand and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. There's an urgency to uh, the repentance and the baptisms that are going on. Because John has a view of eternity in mind. And he says, it's just right at the other side of the door. You've got to do this. You should do this. Uh, A friend of ours, Mark Halleck, is a pastor. 2019 was a 
tough year. His 12-year-old son had cancer. Uh, he is uh, now cancer-free, praise the Lord. But he said, we, we just spent so much, so much time in the hospital, so many days and moments where we thought our son was going to pass. He said, but I've never been a better evangelist than in those moments. Because when eternity is staring you in the face, I just shared the gospel with everybody, everybody that walked through that door. Because it matters. And so repentance matters. Baptism matters. Baptism is an outward symbol of an inward reality. And, and for, uh, for us, it, it, is, it is deeper than that. The word baptizo means to immerse. It, it means to wash. That's how we normally think about that. But in the first century, it had a lot more what we call violent connotations to it. If someone was, uh, died by drowning, they would say they were baptized. If a city was destroyed by an enemy, the city was baptized. If a ship, if a ship sank, the, the ship was baptized. Do you, do you understand kind of the, the, the violent imagery of it? In fact, this is how Paul describes baptism in Romans chapter 6. We were buried with Christ in his death and baptism and raised to newness of life. Baptism, therefore, is a symbol of, of a reality that we died to our old self. And through faith and grace, we, we are raised to new life just as Christ was raised to new life. But there is a problem. There's a problem even with all this. The good news hasn't come yet. Yes, repentance and trusting in God is always the front door to the kingdom. But, but our repentance is still tainted, isn't it? Uh, Paul read uh, from one of the Valley of Vision prayers, and I didn't know he was going to do that, but I have another reading from the Valley of Vision today where he talks about we need to repent of our repentance. Even our repentance is marred. Our our baptism doesn't actually wash us. It doesn't actually remove the, the stain of sin. It doesn't actually do anything magical to us. We need something better. Here's what the Valley of Vision Puritan's prayer said. He said, but in our Christian walk, we are still in rags. Our best prayers are stained with sin. Our penitential tears are so much iniquity. Our confessions of wrong are so many aggravations of sin. Our receiving the Spirit is tinctured with selfishness. We need to repent of our repentance. We need our tears to be washed. We have no robe to bring to cover our sins. No loom to weave our own righteousness. This is why when you feel that and you feel like, man, just a a burden, this is where the gospel comes in. I've been so pumped for the next few verses all week. I, I I hope you are too by the end. Look at verse 13. Then Jesus came from Galilee to Jordan to John to be baptized by him. Now there's a problem. Remember what John's baptism is. It's a baptism of repentance. And so uh, this should cause something in your mind. Like, why would Jesus go to John and be baptized? He is, he is the one person who has no need for baptism. In fact, John senses this in verse 14. John would have prevented him saying, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? He's incredulous. There's, there's no way I'm going to baptize you, Jesus. I, I need you to baptize me. Look at verse 15. And this is where the gospel begins to take root. But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Jesus is beginning His ministry of substitution. The gospel is about substitution. Jesus had no need for repentance. But Jesus from his first days would be associated with sinners. And he says, I'm going to be a substitute for sinners. So yeah, you're going to baptize me. Not because I have need of repentance. But all the sinners that I save need a perfect repentance. Need a perfect baptism. And I will take their place. I'll take their place. But it gets better than that. He says, uh, uh, then he consented. 
He, he's baptized. So, so often here, and rightly so, we talk about Jesus' work of substitution. 2 Corinthians 5.17, he became sin who knew no sin that we might become the righteousness of God. But if, if we only need Jesus to die for us, then Herod could have killed him last week as he was a baby. We didn't just need Jesus to die for us on the cross to pay for our sins. We needed more than that. Did you see, are you starting to see what's happening here? We, we don't just get forgiven of sins. Everything gets exchanged. We get his righteousness. We, we get what, what theologians call, what do they call it? Sorry, baby threw me off. We get uh, Christ's active obedience. Okay, so you're not getting this yet. So, so you're, you're living your life, and every day, in thought, word, and deed, you're falling short. You're falling short. You're falling short. Jesus never did. 33 years, Jesus never fell short in thought, word, and deed. Yes, he takes your sin on the cross, but in his substitutionary work, he gives you his righteousness. You get his active obedience. It's as if God looks at you and sees Jesus' 33 years of perfect law-keeping credited to your account. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water and behold, the heavens were open to him and he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. But again, remember Matthew's point right here. He's not just describing the scene where, oh yes, the spirit's coming down on Jesus. Matthew's point is Jesus is taking the substitutionary work for us. So what is Jesus's is now ours. What is ours is Jesus. So as the spirit comes down and we know empowers his life for life and ministry and miracles, that spirit is now available and in our lives for empowerment. The same spirit, that's our gift. But it gets even better than that. Look at verse 17. And behold... A voice booming from heaven said, This is my beloved son, whom I am well pleased. That's not just for Jesus. If Jesus is substituting for us, that's for you. And if you have Jesus' righteousness, if you have Jesus in you, if you are dead and Jesus' life is lived in you, then a booming voice from heaven is declaring over you, you are my beloved son and daughter in whom I am well pleased. This is good news. Do you see how that's so much better than self-help? How that's so much better than trying to convince ourselves that we're good enough, we're smart enough, and not gonna, uh, people like us? No, we have the voice of the one who spoke the universe saying, you are my beloved son. You are my beloved daughter. I am well pleased in you. And you have perfect righteousness because Jesus gave it to you. So let us be a people, imperfect as we are, Let us repent for the kingdom of heaven is here. Let us take baptism seriously. Not because it does anything magically, but because it proclaims to the world the goodness of the gospel of grace. And because we don't want to live in disobedience to this king, we want to live in obedience to this king. And so we get baptized if you haven't done so. Man, don't wait. Come talk to us. Let's figure it out. We'll, We'll get the horse trough out here next week. Let us be a people that walk confidently, that on our bed, when, when, when the enemy begins to tell us that you're not good enough, you're not smart enough, we say, you know what, you're right, but we got Jesus. <laughs> Amen. Martin Luther, he was a strange guy, <laughs> but he would say that he would battle with the devil every night. Every night, the devil would show up. But you know what he would say to it? He said he would do two things. <laughs> I, I didn't know I was going to share this, but I told Matthew this way. He said, uh, the devil would show up and he would look at him and he'd say, devil, you have no place in here because I've been baptized. Now, Luther was not trusting in his baptism. Luther was trusting in what the baptism symbolized. He, he's left the dominion of darkness, the wilderness of sin, and he's crossed over into the kingdom of light. And he says, you have no place in here. I've been baptized. And Luther said, the next thing I would do, because the devil is such a prideful person, I would pass strong gas. <laughs> because you can't be more offensive to someone than just farting in their face. 
That's not how I wanted to end this sermon. I'll need to move that. Here we are. (laughs) Nevertheless, you have the Spirit because Jesus came and gave you a perfect repentance, a perfect baptism, a perfect life, death, burial, resurrection, if you've trusted in Him and stepped into the kingdom. You have God saying over you today, you are my beloved son and daughter whom I'm well pleased to that end, let's walk out of here and live like that. Let me pray. Father, thank you for your word to us this morning. Thank you for the gospel of grace. Thank you for Jesus coming and being baptized in our place, repenting for us, even when we couldn't do it on our own. Thank you, Jesus, for your deep magic that transferred us from the dominion of darkness into the kingdom of the sun and making us sons and daughters in the king. We praise these things all in his matchless name. Jesus. Amen.